Well, thanks very much, Kent. Uh, and thanks very much uh, for the warm Southern hospitality <laughs> that I've gotten from uh, Roger and, and Barbara Orth. Uh, really uh, much different than what I normally get. So, <laughs> um, I'm going to talk about uh, an emerging uh, field, the human microbiome, and the revolution to come in digital health. Um, but I want to start back here. <laughs> so on your right, in about 1960, or 61, um, is uh, me, my two brothers, and my mother. And every summer, uh, our family came down. Uh, her, mother, her family was in Mississippi. But we came over to Pensacola Beach, went out over the causeway from Gulf Breeze, and um, I just thought that was the way the world was, you know. Um, <laughs> It was just, uh, it, it really had a huge influ influence on me. Um, and in not the least, <laughs> because of Bob Davis, who became actually a good friend of our uh, families, and the Allen Davis uh, seashell place, uh, I have next to my dining table in La Jolla a large uh, china cupboard full of hundreds of shells, most of which I got at that shop. <laughs> um, and that really set me off that, I mean, these, these early impressions, you never know what, you know, kids are going to do when, uh, with, with early vacation experiences. Uh, but it led me to be intensely interested in marine biology, and in particular, even though I was a physicist and then a computer scientist, uh, spent several decades uh, snorkeling mainly, although some scuba diving, around the world and seeing the difference between uh, healthy coral reefs and ones that have been degraded by both humans mostly, uh, but also other things. So much so that I decided that to really understand the sensitivity of these, I would build my own coral reef in my living room. And so this is a 120-gallon uh, coral reef with dozens of different kinds of coral um, and, and shrimp and different fish and so forth. So across a whole wide range of types of animals. And what I was after was what, how sensitive are these ecologies? And what does it take for them to go from a healthy, uh, beautiful environment to complete collapse? Uh, and as you will see, uh, I've spent the last decade trying to understand that about my own body and the difference between health and disease, uh, treating your body as it really is, which is an incredibly complex ecology, and that's what we'll get to. Now, uh, here I was at the Supercomputer Center at the University of Illinois. That's a proposal going in for, I forget, $100 million or something to the National Science Foundation for our renewal. Uh, but that's me at 41, and you can see I looked about the same as I did at uh, 18, right? Uh, but then a terrible thing happened, uh, which is called the 40s. Uh, and as you see, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be awfully transparent uh, about my body to you. Um, and so what you see here is uh, actually an average American. Uh, we're now two-thirds overweight or obese in this country and had done this for 30 years straight as, a, as an epidemic, essentially. And so when I got to La Jolla in 2000 and I looked around and everybody looked very different than I did, uh, I realized that I had better get with the program or they were going to send me back to the Midwest. <laughs> and so here I am 10 years older. Uh, and the way that I reversed the natural decline of aging uh, was by quantifying my body, the intake of the types of food particularly, uh, and then uh, exercise. And so uh, I ended up over the last five years using virtually every gadget as it came out. 
Um, so I step on the Withing scale and that goes to the cloud and I can pull it up on my smartphone uh, and look at trends over years. Um, I try to get 10,000, get about 8,000 steps a day. Um, I, uh, the Zio, uh, this is a company, this is, we're already so far along in this takeoff of these gadget uh, market that uh, some of them are gone bankrupt. <laughs> so Zio, which uh, is a thing that measures your brain waves and you can tell the difference between whether you're every 30 seconds, whether you're in awake and light sleep, deep sleep, or, or, or REM, dream sleep. Uh, I did 700 nights uh, of that. And as they shut the place down, I realized this was coming. I raced to their server and downloaded all of my data. <laughs> now, this is not as bad as it looks because this was the MIT Tech Review picture of me. Uh, that is in our uh, uh, exercise physiology lab in my institute at the University of California, San Diego. Um, and I was, uh, you know, doing a stress test with uh, uh, a lot of uh, electrocardiograph. And this article was called The Patient of the Future because what I was doing was taking control of my own body, learning about it at a level of depth that doctors do not have the time anymore, the way the thing's set up, uh, the medical industry, to, to really, uh, uh, in fact, I'll see, you'll see I took it a little bit further. But where we're going is from these measurements you make on the outside to inside my body. And so the rest of the talk is going to be inside me. Now, you hear a lot about big data, and you know that medical science, biology are one of the big drivers of it. But it's a lot bigger, and it's growing a lot faster than you might realize. So in 2000, when I said I got there, I was weighed a lot more than, than I do now. Um, I naturally got on the scale every day, and I said, well, okay, that's me, you know, so many pounds. That was one number. This is a billion-fold log scale. So each of those lines is ten times the one below it. And so when I, by uh, the 2005, I was uh, taking, having blood taken and then sending it off and getting tests, uh, and, and then... Uh, measuring uh, over a hundred different variables in my body every couple of months. And then when 23andMe came out, I was one of the early users of that to measure your human genome, which I'll share with you in a minute how that worked out. Um, and that is one million points along your human genome. So I'm up to a million points defining me. And then, as I will say, I did my gut microbiome and uh, that now, every time I take a stool sample and send it off to be genetically sequenced, and I get back um, about uh, 20 billion numbers. And, and that change, and I do that every uh, couple of months, and that changes completely, as we'll see. So in case you think this is going to be in your electronic medical record in your doctor's office, think again. And the whole point is that this big data is challenging the very conservative and slowly changing world of the medical uh, community into something that is much more like the information technology world and with that rate of change. Now, during that first five years, I was all excited about this. I was losing weight. I was, you know, my ellipticals and was going faster and faster. My steps were going up. Uh, you know, I said, but this is great, I love this. Quantifying yourself, it really works. What I didn't expect was to find out that I had a chronic incurable disease uh, by simply measuring my body. So, how did that work? Well, here we are at my institute, uh, California Institute for Telecommunication Information Technology, uh, in, uh, and, and this, we have these walls, each of those little black uh, rectangles is a, is a high definition screen like you'd have in your home theater, <laughs> except we have 32 of them. And, and so that's 64 million pixels. And I can look at all 150 variables. Each of those uh, squiggly things is uh, five to 10 years of the graph of the variable 
across these 150 variables. So this is your cholesterol, but it's also your liver enzyme, your kidneys, your red blood cells, your white blood cells, all of your electrolytes. But in addition, um, a lot of your immune variables that you don't pick up in the blood. Now, you know, whenever you get one of these things from the doctor, they'll say, well, it's in the normal range, or, you know, or it's high or something like that. And maybe we better look at this. Well, out of all those, the one blood variable that was way out of normal range, and normal range is below the green line, uh, is what's called complex reactive protein. I had no idea what that was. Remember, I, don't, I, I have no biomedical training, so I'm a physicist and a, and a computer scientist and a mathematician and a lifetime scientist, but I can read scientific articles, and so I've read you know, five or 600 uh, in the last few years. And so I, I and, and of course we have Mr. Google. So I go on to Google and I say, what is complex reactive protein? And it turns out that it's a generic measure of inflammation in your body. And so it's supposed to be less than one. And I started out back in 2005 at five times the upper limit. And then I went to 10 times and then 15 times. And I would go and I, you know, so imagine I only had the data up to that first time it hits 15. I would print this out, take it into my doctor and I'd say, something terrible is going on inside of me. And they said, oh, really? How do you feel? <laughs> and I said, great. <laughs> well, why are you here? <laughs> because I have data. <laughs> and they said, well, that's not useful. <laughs> Go away. I've got six peop sick people to deal with. So, um, so then I had an acute uh, pain that it happened while I was off on one of these things like this, giving a talk on the weekend. I went in the doctor and I said, and that's where that first spike is. And I said, I've got good news for you. <laughs> what they said, I said, I've got a symptom. <laughs> and, 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 and so they decided, oh, I must have diverticulitis, which I do have diverticula. But um, in fact, they misdiagnosed what actually was going on. Because then, as you can see, even though I had just 10 days of antibiotics, it didn't go down below one, and then it kept up until finally it got up to 27. And that peak is going to be where we take the first stool sample that I'll tell you about the microbiome. Uh, and then it came back down, and the fall back down was before I did the antibiotics. Now, how do I know that? Because after I agreed with the doctor to go through a month of antibiotics and two months of prednisone, um, I took a blood test the day before. Because otherwise, how would you know what this did to you? The doctor didn't tell me to do that. Quantifying my body told me to do that. And what I noticed is my natural immune system caused most of the collapse of the inflammation before I took the antibiotics. If I hadn't had that one data point just before the red there, the doctor would have said, and I love doctors, I know no, not criticizing doctors, but they would have said, see how good antibiotics are. That's what doing time series is all about, is to really understand what your body is doing and not make assumptions about it. Now, I dug a little further. I said, well, okay, something's driving this. And my, I had completely changed my diet to organic, locally grown, only grass-fed meat, you know, mostly fish. Uh, highly fit, lots of vegetables. Um, and I had changed from the average American, which has, say, 20 times as much omega-6, which is the inflammatory fatty acid, as omega-3, which is the, ant it's like olive oil and, and nuts and avocados and things, which is the anti-inflammatory kind. Uh, it's about 20 times as much of the inflammatory kind. I was down to one and a half <laughs> times. So I was like a hunter-gatherer. So I knew that it wasn't from my food that I had this inflammation. I figured something had to be going on inside of me, and that's what I was worried about. I had no idea what it might be. But by taking the stool measurements, and I had no idea why to do that other than I was going to get more data points. I was going to get different variables. And the place that I was getting the, the blood samples from, I said, by the way, we can do a comprehensive stool kit. I said, cool, more data. And so I sent off a sample, and it comes back. And this is one of the things they measure in your immune system called lactoferrin. I had no idea what lactoferrin was. Turns out the lacto is mother's milk and ferrin is iron. And it has to do with, uh, it's an antimicrobial. Um, it's, it's one of the body's ways of uh, 
sequestering, keeping iron away from the microbes who actually live only well if they have iron. So it's part of the body's uh, defense mechanism. Well, it's supposed to be less than seven, which is that green line. When it got up to 900, I, I said, 900, okay, this is, let's go back to the literature. And I had, you know, 10 peer-reviewed papers saying the only way you can have lactoferrin at that level is if you have uh, inflammatory bowel disease, which is a autoimmune disease. About a million some odd Americans, million and a half have it. Uh, it's two kinds, Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. Um, and uh, notice I've 125 the upper limit. Now, to this day, even though I'm under one of the best um, doctors in the country for this, he was head of our uh, gastroenterology department, I have not had a doctor ask me to take a stool test quantitatively for lactoferrin. And I go through a lot of doctors. <laughs> now I figured, if that's the case, what's the immune system all upset about? And of course, we had been learning about the gut microbiome during this last five years. And so I said, okay, what about if I look at my microbes? Now it turns out that same stool kit cultures, you put in Petri dishes, you know, a little bit of, you know, you gotta go over the stool thing. There, <laughs> okay? The point is, it's, a, it's the most information rich material you have ever laid eyes on, <laughs> okay? Let's think about it. There's a billion, a billion microbes per gram. And each of those is five million DNA bases long. Right? And all you do is flush it down the toilet. Well, <laughs> instead, measure it. And so uh, you send it off and they do these Petri dishes. And what you can see is the blue Four, they measure it as four, three, two, one, or zero, and they do four different kinds of bacteria. There should be four parallel bars across at that level, so it'd be up to 16, if I were normal, if I was healthy. But instead, you see this oscillation going on, just as you saw the oscillation in the immune system. So the logical conclusion is my immune system is fighting a time-changing microbiome. That's my hypothesis, as they say. Well, how to confirm it? So if I had IBD, did I have Crohn's or uh, ulcerative colitis? Well, the difference is Crohn's as an autoimmune, your, your white blood cells actually um, tunnel into your wall of your, of your large intestine and cause uh, major uh, inflammation and um, thickening of them. So I got an MRI, I got in a tube, got an MRI, with you know, taking three bottles of barium sulfate to give contrast for the colon and then getting injected with the dye in your arteries so that the veins would show up. And so as soon as I got out of it, I said, well, give me the data. And then I went back to our um, institute and we could look at it as, as the radiologists do as slices. So there's the liver, the transverse colon, the small intestine, and then there's that funny looking thing which is about here, the sigmoid colon. So that's where the large intestine comes down, goes around, back through the back, and out. So, um, but because we had 3D interactive virtual reality professionals, they took it and turned it into a 3D video game where I could fly through my guts. <laughs> and so that's the aorta in red coming down, splitting into the two iliac uh, arteries that go down your legs, uh, and that's the descending colon, and then there's this funny looking little, little kink, and then, and then you can see going across in the blue is um, a rather thick looking piece of colon, which we can then, in computer graphics, I can just pull it out, uh, and you can see the, how, how not smooth it is. You probably think your colon is like a salami or something, with, <laughs> since that's what the coating of the salami is, is an intestine from another animal. Um, but in fact, it's, it, these are diverticula. But it's not the diverticula the way that the, the GI doc sees when it does a colonoscopy, which is that you see the little openings in the wall that 
But this is the cave itself as seen from the outside, which by and large they never see as GI docs. Any GI, how many GI docs do I have in the audience? Okay, have you ever seen the outside of the diverticula? Okay, I got one advanced GI doc. Okay, <laughs> so, so what you do then is, because it's in computer graphics, I can just slice through it, and what you can see is the wall, which ought to be three millimeters thick, is about 15. Okay, but here's the cool thing. You know, you've heard about these 3D printers? So I said, well, that's a 3D object. Can't you just print me up a colon? <laughs> and here, see? Here's, here's the descending colon. Here's this little thing. And then you can see, if you look at this, is much more swollen. And of course, you're looking mainly at the contrast, the barium sulfate that was in there. But if you look around here, you see the mesenteric arteries on the back. That's from the vein, the, you know, the inject, the, the dye, the injector. It's sort of, you know, this is what's causing all that inflammation right here. Being able to hold it in your hand, you know your enemy. <laughs> you want to you wanna hold my colon? <laughs> it's okay. So, so seriously, I got to think, okay, how can I have, an, how can I be 65 and not got the memo that I had an autoimmune disease all my life, right? So I started reading up about IBD and Crohn's in particular. And here is from a 2007 paper from Stanford. And if you picked up a 2014 paper, it would say exactly the same thing. We do not know today how this disease happens. We don't know what, but we know that there must be a human genetic predisposition. There are 80 of these autoimmune diseases known to the NIH, the National Institutes of Health. So there's something in my human genome that is not the way a healthy person would be. But then there's the immune dysfunction. Well, we've seen that. You know, I got immune system going all over the place instead of just being nice and quiet. Um, and then microbial components. Okay. So I said, cool. I mean, this is scientific literature. You know, it's sort of like, I'm sort of like turning my body into a science fair project. <laughs> and it's picking up all those shells on the beach at Pensacola that did it, I think. <laughs> um, so I said, hey, I bet I can quantify all three of these things. Well, why? Why hasn't this been done forever? This graph, which again is on a log scale, look over the side, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, a million, 10 million, 100 million dollars to do one human genome. And you'll notice, uh, and in fact, as of last week, Illumina announced that you went all the way to the bottom, $1,000. So you've had um, essentially 100, uh, a, 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 you've had a, 10,000 have had basically now, because this is, I haven't got the latest dot on it, a um, 100,000 fold <coughs> decrease in cost. Now, think about it. When was the last time you heard of something in the medical field that had gone down by 100,000 times in cost? <laughs> right? This is linking to the IT revolution. That's what it's all about. That's what will eventually save the healthcare. So what happens is this lets you do both the human and the microbial genome. Now, I know we're not like geneticists. I mean, how many geneticists do I have? Because then I'll, good. Uh, <laughs> uh, but here's your human DNA. As you know, it's a spiral that has these, these steps. And these steps are your so-called bases. And they can be, you know, ATs or Cs and Gs. Um, it doesn't matter what those stand for that's a code, basically, and it spells out the genes, and then those make proteins, and that makes you. So the, um, but occasionally, at a certain location, what was a C or a G becomes a T or A by just a mutation, or by, um, you know, when your parents' DNAs, you take one from each and you put them together to make a child, um, you can end up with a change at that point. Well, these are called single nucleotide polymorphisms, which I won't say again, I'll just say SNP for the, that's what they're called. 
Uh, it turns out that, you know, all of the difference here between all of us, but now think of the difference of all humans on Earth. About 90% of the variation in, in the genomes of all humans on Earth occur at these locations. Um, and they're about every 100 to 300 bases you can get this, okay? So by looking at these, you really can sort of boil it down to what's the difference between people and including your genetic predispositions for things like autoimmune diseases. So I went to, you know, I thought, well, this is cool. I was, I was an early adopter 23 of me, and so I said, I wonder what it's going to tell me. So you go in 23 of me and you put Crohn's, and lo and behold, you get this, and these are, each of these are a SNP location, one of those, and there are one million of them out of the six billion, ba you know, bases along your DNA. And, and these are the ones where they've done studies called genome-wide association studies where they'll take, say, 100 people that have Crohn's and 100 people that are healthy, they'll do their SNPs and put them in a machine and do the statistics on them and find which are the locations where the people with Crohn's tend to have these and the people that are healthy don't. And so each of those is one of those that associates with Crohn's. If they're green, they're protective. But there's this big red thing. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out that's called interleukin-23 receptor. I had no idea what that was. So I went to Wikipedia. <laughs> and, and it turns out that is a gene on the first chromosome. Um, and if you have it, what it means is in your immune system, there's a set of things that are called cytokines, and you can get uh, one of them that's more pro-inflammatory because there's a balance between the ones that make inflammation and ones that make anti-inflammation, roughly speaking. So I then went into the literature and started looking for interleukin-23, and guess what I found? An article from uh, Nature Medicine a few years ago that it's a master regulator in Crohn's disease. So here, I just sent some spit. That's all I did to 23andMe <laughs> back in 2008. And then a couple of years ago, I thought to go back and, and look for it. And sure enough, I had this genetic predisposition. So now it's known that there are 163 different locations along the hu full human DNA that are associated with inflammatory bowel disease, making it the genetically most complex disease known. Uh, and so we're now going through it. And, and in the meantime, I got my whole genome done, of course, my whole human genome. So now we're going back and looking at my whole human genome, looking at these 163 uh, locations and so forth. But the point is, I had a genetic predisposition to make my immune system more inflammatory in, in, in when it was challenged than would necessarily be the case. Okay, well, going back again into my youth, I uh, did 25 years of relativistic astrophysics. I uh, worked with Stephen Hawking. I did a lot of things in general activity in the early days of black holes and things. But in particular, I carried out X-ray observations from the first, uh, the Einstein Observatory around the Earth, uh, radio telescope and optical telescope. And particularly, we were looking at Andromeda. This is our sister galaxy. And there are about 100 billion stars uh, in our Milky Way galaxy or in uh, Andromeda. And I was focused particularly on that white bulge in the middle looking for globular clusters. Anyway, that's a lot of stars, right? 100 billion. Turns out there are 1,000 times as many microbes, individual bacterial cells in your body as there are stars in that galaxy. Okay. So you have about 10 trillion human cells and about 100 trillion bacterial cells, and that makes you the ecology, the superorganism. So I said, well, if I'd have, I could observe a galaxy, why don't I just turn the telescope sort of inward and look at my 100 trillion uh, non-human cells? Because your body has, as I say, 10 <laughs> times as many of these. All of medicine to date ignores them. They might have individual microbes, like if you get sick with something. But this is hundreds of species 
that do most of keeping you healthy. You know, that's their main purpose. And in terms of the genes, you know, that you have, you hear about genes on your human genome, each one makes a protein. It turns out there are about 100 times as many genes in the DNA of those microbes as in your human DNA. Again, none of that's part of medicine. It will be, and it is fast becoming a part of medicine, but it isn't. Nothing that's in the current way of doing things are based on this. So it's going to radically change medicine. Now, I'm not here to tell you how, but when you bring in 99% of the thing that you're studying, it's definitely going to change things. So this became obvious last year, and, uh, and, and 2012 even. So here's the cover of Scientific American, your inner ecosystem, in your body, bacteria outnumber your own cells 10 to 1, who's in control. And, but here's the one I love, the economist? The economist thinks it's important to have this on its cover? I get the economist. I think it's one of the greatest magazines on earth, but really, the microbiome? So um, this is no longer obscure. Okay, so let's, before I dive into bacteriotes and firmicutes and all this stuff that you've never heard of, it doesn't matter, um, what I thought is I'd review a little bit biological diversity. So when we look at a goldfish or a frog or, uh, you know, birds, gorillas, blue whales, we think that's a lot of bio. That's what we think of as diversity. You go to a zoo, you're going to see some biological diversity. The trouble is, all these are vertebra, and it turns out that the vertebra is a subphylum. The phylum is the largest division in in the biological world. Now, if you include, in addition, chordata is the phylum that the vertebrates are in. So I got a tiger there to represent all of us. Um, well, I need five more phylums to have enough diversity to talk about the microbes inside your gut. So, for instance, we could add a million different kinds of insects. We could add um, all of the mollusk uh, in the ocean. We could add all of the segmented worms. We could add all of the, the, the radially symmetric things like starfish uh, and corals, uh, the, the jellyfish. Uh, so that now begins to get to be a lot of biological diversity, right? Well, it turns out that if you look at the differences in the genome, which is after all the blueprint from what makes this living creature what it is, uh, Carl Woes, who was a, a wonderful uh, pioneer, and I was fortunate enough when I was at Illinois to get time with him, uh, he's now, he's died la last year, but uh, he figured out a way to take one particular part of the genome and look at it across all species of life on Earth. And this is the tree, and you'll notice that all those, that biodiversity we just saw is called animals. <laughs> that little, you see, you're, you're part of that and you're hardly distinguishable between a slime mole and a mushroom, <laughs> you see, once you look at the microbial world. Okay, and, and, and if you begin to look at just things like what are in, in your, all of you, uh, there's the methanobacteria, gram-positive bacteria, proteobacteria, bacteriotes. So, so there's a vast, even, even just saying that there's five or six of these phyla in, in your gut isn't enough, because there's actually a lot more, but main ones, isn't enough to really get at how diverse is it. And we just can't think about this. We, we, we just don't know what, how to, how to, put this in any kind of context or perspective, and that's one of the things that makes this so interesting, this new world that we're finding out. So the NIH, National Institutes of Health, put in place uh, a, a big uh, program called the Human Microbiome Project the last seven years or so. And what you can see here is the colors down at the bottom, and, and again, don't try to remember the names because I can barely remember them, but let's look at the colors. They're, these are each phylum. So remember, like one of them think of as the insects, and one of them is the squids, and you know, uh, so on. And uh, you have these microbes all over you, in your nose, and your ear, your hair, mouth, all the way down your tube, uh, your skin, of course, um, uh, uh, vaginal, et cetera. 
Uh, and each one has a slightly different, um, you know, dominant uh, area with uh, kind of phylum, kind of bacteria. Um, but if you look at the gastrointestinal tract uh, right here, then you can see that there's basically just two phyla, the bacteriotes and the firmicutes, that, you know, in a healthy person, dominate. Remember that. Um, so, uh, as a result of several hundred million dollars of work, uh, research that was put into this, uh, in 2012, the first set of papers on what is the microbiome in a healthy person, by looking at several hundred people and sampling all these parts of the bodies and everything. So, knowing what a healthy person's microbiome looks like is a year and a half old. <laughs> this is really frontier science. Now, let me just show you an example of what we learned. This is pretty counterintuitive. If you look at the difference between cesarean and uh, natural vaginal birth, there's a huge difference in the initial microbiome that the infant starts with. So over there, the, the light blue are uh, the microbes taken off of the baby after birth if it's cesarean, and the dark blue are the mother's skin microbiome, which you'll remember is, there's the skin on the other side of where the other, it's a completely different microbiome. It's a completely different ecology. And, um, and, and the red are um, the vaginal uh, ecology of the microbes and the baby's skin if it's normal birth. Well, this is why doctors are saying in research articles that because you start off with such a different microbiome, and I'm not even talking about breastfed or not, which is a whole nother, uh, the mother's breast milk contains microbes as well as about half of it can't be digested by the baby, only by the microbes. So it's feeding the microbes. That's what the breast milk does. Won't find that in formula. Uh, and <laughs> Uh, and, and, and then, of course, whether you've gotten antibiotics or not, as, you know, and a child screams to give them antibiotics. Well, that destroys and, and re, you know, changes the, the microbiome. So, so it's not crazy that we end up finding all this growth in allergies and asthma and all these other things may be related to how you start. Now, here are the first year, basically, a little over a year, of the microbiome of a new infant. So it starts out all essentially in the blue is the firmicutes. And then at the end, now you see the red, the bacteriotes, that was a different color in the previous one, but that's the dominant <laughs> one, and the firmicutes are the, the partner. So after about one year, the baby has an adult distribution of microbes, amazingly, if, if it all goes well. Now, if you are an adult, and this is uh, an amazing piece of work that was done at MIT by Eric Alm and a uh, um, postdoc, is um, he sampled his stool every day for a year and then genetically sequenced it. And what you see is that center blue, uh, again, is the bacteriotes and the, and the purple, dark purple is the firmicutes. And you can see that although it oscillates, it's roughly stable over time. And this is, remember, every day you're putting three different times all kinds of stuff down your tube, right? Which ends up, you know, in your colon, which is where these five pounds of 100 trillion microbes live. And depending on what you're putting in your mouth, you're, think of like fertilizer, right? I mean, if you, if you go out <laughs> in your garden, you have this really nice garden, and, and, and so think about antibiotics. Basically, you go out and you spray Roundup on everything and hope that'll take the weeds out may get a few other things. And um, if you think about fertilizer, you know, you got those three numbers in the fertilizer. Well, you don't put the stuff on the roses that you put on the azaleas, right? Uh, and, and, and yet we don't think of that. Every time you eat or drink something, you are changing your microbiome as a result. After all, you are building your body with everything you put in your mouth. So I wanted to know what my dynamics of my microbiome looked like. So I worked with Craig Venter, who, of course, you know, was one of the uh, pioneers of the Human Genome Project. They have a, a 
lab in Maryland. And you can see it takes about two weeks from when I have to FedEx on dry ice. I won't get into the details of how you get your stool there. But um, <laughs> anyway, uh, they put this sample in this amazing machine. And it, and it generates what are called reads. That is, it, it reads perfectly about 100 bases. Now remember, a microbe is 5 million long. <laughs> right? And so what we end up with is about um, 190 billion bases. And uh, uh, about uh, when I, we downloaded uh, 35 healthy people, each at one time, and then uh, the only IBD patients that were out there, we had ulcerative colitis and, and Crohn's, uh, we had three patients uh, at, uh, I mean five patients at three times and two patients at different times. I downloaded all that. I ended up with five billion of these Illumina <coughs> sequencing machine reads each 100 basis long. So think of having five billion jigsaw puzzles. And then we pulled down every known full genome of a microbe or a virus or anything that could be in there. That's about 10,000, each five million long of the bacteria, say. And then we took our five billion puzzle pieces and tried to find an exact match. And then I had one of those bugs. <laughs> and then take another one, and five billion times, right? So that requires what we call a supercomputer. And we were fortunate at UC San Diego to have the San Diego Supercomputer Center. I used 25 CPU years to do the computing, right? So take your computer and run it 24-7 all year long, 25 years worth. That's the computing time that I'll, I'm going to have to show you the results from. Well, of course, you get a lot of data. But again, going back to where where my institute is, we have the 64 million pixel wall. Each of those vertical bars is a species of, of, of bacteria, each one of these. And there's 200 of them. And what I'm able to see here is on the left, that's me at three different times. And over here are what uh, a healthy person looks like, a person with Crohn's and a person with ulcerative colitis, averaging over those ones that we pulled down from the NIH. So I'm not going to take you through the details of all that, but I'm going to get what are some lessons we've learned. And this is very preliminary stuff. I haven't even published this. So this is still very preliminary. But we've had 40 years of learning about the dynamics of ecological systems. And so one of the things, normally it's like forest or coral reefs or something. This is what doctors have to learn now. So there are these new. Um, papers that are coming out, this was just uh, 2012, on taking the lessons from ecological theory and bring them to medicine. And so the first thing you learn is that you can have alternate states. So imagine a forest which is at one time a evergreen forest and then becomes an oak forest. Those are both forests, but they're in different equilibrium. There's different distributions of types of plants. Well, here is again, once again, the healthy, this is the average over those 35 healthy people. The red is this uh, bacteriotis, and the blue is a Firmicute, and that looks just like that little cartoon I showed you uh, where there was one that was about three quarters and the other was a quarter. Well, here's what it looks like if you have Crohn's disease. The red is about 1%. So this is not a small change. The, 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 the medical community calls this dysbiosis. This is a mass extinction event. You know when the meteor fell out of the sky 65 million years ago and killed all the dinosaurs? There were 20% of the vertebra families that were wiped out. 80% survived. 95% didn't survive this mass extinction. So, when we talk about a disease state, it's a vastly different change to your, 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 your microbiome is just in a totally different state. And these purple things are actually bifids. So if you take probiotics, you know you get bifids or one of the kinds of bugs you get. Uh, that just explained, explodes. Whereas ulcerative colitis, the balance between those two dominant groups isn't so disturbed, but that's all E. coli in green. Okay. And I can tell you that 
I'm sort of halfway in between these two. I have characteristics of both. So I was 11% um, E. coli. And in those of you who are healthy, it's about six hundredths of a percent. So I was 150 times the E. coli of uh, healthy people. Well, what's another lesson we learned for ecology? This was a ponderosa pine forest, and there was a savage wildfire that, that forest fire that came through and killed all the trees. This is two years later. Notice all of the stuff that was shaded out before. So it was there all the time. That's you know rare. <laughs> but now it's taken over. It's the new ecology. And so once you take the dominant one, so what happens when the dominant, the, that guy, the, the red part that was you know, three quarters, when that's all gone, blooms of all of the other ones that were sitting around waiting for their chance. So let's see if that works. Well, here are the, all of the um, species. Each of those bars is a species of bacteria. You don't need to know what they are, but they're just the most prevalent. And over there is 4%, 3%, 2%, 1%. So these are, the biggest one has about a little over 4% of all your microbes are that kind. Uh, this is all of them that are um, more than 1%. And the red is healthy, and the blue is me. So most of, my, most of the dominant microbes that are in you are not in me. What do I have? Well, for each of the ones I have, the red bar is sitting next to it, and if you look really, really closely, you'll see there is a red bar right here, <laughs> but that's 150 times as much. This is 765 times as much as in a healthy person. I've got, uh, this is really good, I've got 850 times what you have if you're a healthy person of this one, right? So, it, but that's what you would expect from ecological theory. If you wipe out all the oak trees, you're going to get all of these other kinds of things coming up. So the good news is all those is brand new science. We actually intuitively know how to think about this. Um, and I was up at uh, Mount Sinai, where Judy Cho is now. She was at Yale for a long time. Uh, and she talks about there's two kinds of your immune system, the innate immune system and the adaptive. Adaptive is your antibodies and the innate is like point defense on your colon wall. Well, each of these is a stool test, each dot, over 2008 to 2000, and, well, this is now, basically, 2014. And so what you can see is this is, um, it's lysozyme, you don't need to worry about that, but what it is is it's the uh, uh, protein that is an example of the innate immune system, which is your colon wall, which is your, your largest, uh, immune organ in your body is your colon. And if you actually flatten it out, it's about the size of half a tennis court. Okay? But it's got all these little little villi that are up and like that. You flatten them all out. It's a, it's a huge surface, but it's all full of immune organs. And this is the thing that is the last uh, defense against microbes. And you can see it's supposed to be down under the green, and it's in this oscillatory state. Now, down here is your antibody, your most common antibody in your, um, in your in colon. And by the way, there are no charts like this in the scientific literature yet. No one has thought it was important to do a time series, and therefore they haven't discovered that your immune system can actually have these kinds of oscillations. Well, those are the times that I did the stool sample and then did the genome sequencing of it. That's when I had the therapy of a month of antibiotics and two months of prednisone. And so at each of those points in time, this is what my microbiome looked like. The red is, again, the one that's supposed to be dominant. <laughs> the blue is the one that's supposed to be just like a, a quarter. And then there are all these other strange things like my, uh, that, that are showing up there. And you can see that there is this dynamic change of time. Of the, it, it's an ecology. It changes with time. You get more of one and more of the other and so forth. So this is a whole new science that is just uh, emerging. Um, but to turn it into medicine, the next step is that I'm working with this uh, great uh, 
gastroenterology team, research team at the University uh, of California, San Diego, our School of Medicine, uh, led by Bill Sanborn, who's probably the best clinical researcher in, in the country for IBD. We're going to take 150 people, patients, that uh, 50 of them that are uh, with Crohn's, 50 with ulcerative colitis, and 50 that get scoped but turn out to be healthy. And we're going to turn them into me. We're going to do to them the measurements that I've done as an N equal one quantified self. And we're then going to follow, and, the, and the, the thing that's so cool is that these are going to be before therapy. Because all the things we have in the literature after they've had antibiotics and they've had corticosteroid immunosuppressants and, and so of course you have no idea what, remember we, we want to know how this disease comes to be in time. So we're going to have the first time that we'll be able, and then we'll follow them, we'll get their state, then they'll get some therapy and then we'll follow them three months, six months, a year to see how the microbiome reacts to that particular therapy. No one's done that carefully before. Now, you might be guessing, well, what are the tools <laughs> that we're going to use in our garden to bring it back to health if it's, say, not? And the New York Times had a wonderful article in 2012 after those science and nature articles came out. And, and this is by a senior research doctor at the National Institutes of Health at the Human Genome, uh, Human Genome Research Institute saying, we got to stop this language that we've had for ever since antibiotics were developed that the bugs are bad. They're the enemy and we got to kill them. What you got to learn about is you aren't going to be living a healthy life if you're not taking very good care of them. And so that is in the New York Times by the, one of the leading research doctors in the country uh, at the National Institutes of Health. So where we're going, as far as I can tell, in terms of the disruption and, and of, of the healthcare industry, what you've seen is predictive. If you looked at those things, you could see that, that as I started into one of these phases, it just, once it went oscillating, it just kept going, right? But if you could see it was starting to come and then do something at that point and you'd come back to normal, maybe my immune system wouldn't have put me through what I've been through for the last few years, which I spared you the details of. It's personalized medicine in that each one of us has to take responsibility for the health of our bodies every day. Every time you eat something, you drink something, whether you exercise or you don't exercise, no doctor is going to fix your body for you. You might see a doctor 10 minutes, 20 minutes, a half an hour, a year, all the rest of the time is your time. And you either take responsibility or you don't. So medicine is going to be personalized. It's going to be preventative because if, like our automobiles, where we follow every minute our spark plugs and our brakes and everything else, and you go in every 20,000 miles, they read it out, they compare it across the population, and if anything's starting to get out of normal, then they fix it. And so the car never develops a chronic disease we haven't done that yet in medicine because we haven't been able to measure a time series enough and measure things like 90% of the cells. Now we can. Uh, but we have to get it cheap enough that it can be widespread and that's happening because it's essentially on the IT curve. But in the end of the day, it has to be participatory. That is, it's not somebody else who's going to make you healthy. It's only you. And if you don't, you can participate the way most Americans have for the last 30 years, which is about to bankrupt the country from the results of that experiment, or we can decide that we're going to take control, each of us, for ourselves. We're going to learn a lot more than we have been having to learn, uh, and we're going to have a whole new world of gadgets and measurement devices to help us read out the state of our bodies and keep us, hopefully, much healthier for much longer than the way we were the last hundred years. So I'm going to stop here and then we'll take some questions. We've got to have microphones. Okay?
right here. Where is FDA at this point on 23 and me in permitting them to give you more than just your uh, historical genetic background, giving you the specifics the way they used to before they started this newest nonsense? So you may have read in the paper or heard on the radio t TV that uh, the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, has uh, gotten into a dispute with 23andMe, which is the startup that actually does this sit and spit and they give you back this information about your human genome. Um, well, uh, when 23andMe and the FDA come to an agreement, things will carry on as they were. Uh, the FDA does have jurisdiction if you claim that something has medicinal help, like information that you get from the genome. Um, 23andMe has a lot of smart people working for it, and I think they will figure out what they have to do and hopefully will get past it. But that's an early skirmish. Think about this. All of this data that you're, I mean, who's, who's got a Fitbit on tonight? Huh? Okay, I got at least one person. So here's my Fitbit. I'm also doing a Withings Pulse, which is, will measure my pulse as well as my steps and caloric burn and so forth. Um, and all of the data that's being generated by those things, all the data here that I generated, it's not in my medical record. It's outside of the entire medical establishment. It's in your hands as consumers. So this is an early skirmish in the war between the existing medical establishment and this huge empowerment that's coming because of IT finally making it to medicine that's coming in, in all the consumer products. And that is a classic IT disruption. And what I'm trying to do to help Lee Hood, he's the guy who actually invented the gene sequencer. Um, I'm actually his lab rat, effectively. <laughs> a human. Over here. Thank you for a splendid lecture. Uh, reportedly, 75% of said the standard American diet is inflammatory. That's yes. been going on for three generations. With all of your experiences and education, what sh would you share with us your personal uh, procedure for minimizing inflammatory response in the gut, which causes the negative mutations? So, um, yes, we live in a world of processed food that I believe is uh, not good for your health but I'd rather you read uh, Salt, Sugar, and Fat, which is an investigative uh, New York Times reporter has written this wonderful book on the processed food industry. Um, uh, there, if, if food wasn't inflammatory, we wouldn't have the Americans having an average of 20 times uh, as much omega-6, which drives inflammation, as they do from their food uh, compared to omega-3. Uh, so, omega-6 is corn oil, the first order. The average American, and um, I mean, you look at what, what caused, you know, the obesity epidemic for three decades just to get more and more and more out of hand. Um, there's many factors, but, but you might say, uh, has anything changed during that time? Take um, high fructose corn syrup. Um, the average American in 1970 consumed one pound per year. The average American today consumes 50 pounds because it's in every, almost every processed food. So just, I don't know whether there's a, that's just a correlation or, or what, but there's a lot of things like that. All the antibiotics that are being used to fatten farm animals, you know that 80% of the antibiotics in this country go into animals to fatten them? And you wonder, running out of antibiotics, you wonder how come there's so many, uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria. So the FDA has just again, uh, finally, after decades of discussing it, um, confronted that industry. So I think you're gonna see a lot of this. It's gonna be very noisy, and you're gonna hear a lot of contradictory claims, but that's what a revolution's about. Here we go, down. How much of the change would you say comes from like what we eat as opposed to what's on our skin, since you said so much of it comes from ingestion. Yeah, so the other big factor is the rise of antibacterial everything. 
How many of you use antibacterial soap at home? Okay. Now your skin microbiome is there for a reason, and it's, if you take it off, you actually can get a lot of bad things that happen to your skin. On the other hand, you don't want during flu season to be, you know, you want to be washing your hands. So there's, but all that antibacterial, all the antibodies that are in the food you're eating, which, you know, do, do get into your body and then disrupt, uh, uh, it looks as if there's at least studies that are indicating that that's the case, disrupt your microbiome. So we, we meant to do good with each of these things. And these you can call unintended consequences, but if you would just look at the data of this 30-year uncontrolled experiment, you get a pretty good idea that we ought to be looking a lot more closely from public health point of view at the pseudo-food environment that we're in, embedded in. Time for two more questions. Yeah, here's one up front. In your experiments with Crohn's disease and ulcerative uh, colitis, um, are you going to look at, at like different generations with Crohn's disease since it does seem to have some passed down? Yes. So, so we will take, um, the, we will do a SNP analysis of the human genome for all of the people. And um, it's actually, if we could get multi-generational people in the study, the trouble is if you want to just have people who haven't been treated, you're not going to get that in a multi-generational study. Um, so, th and we're not the only one doing this. There are a lot of other places, and this is one of 80 autoimmune diseases. The same thing needs to be done for all of them. So there is an enormous, enormous amount of research that has to be done, and I just wanted to give you a little view of, you know, watch this space over the next five to ten years. One more question? Here. Um, the numbers for uh, the number of bacterial cells compared to human cells in the body was impressive. How does the mass compare? Five pounds to whatever your mass is. So the, the 100 trillion turn out, because the bacterial cells are smaller than the human cells, uh, you, have, you carry around about five pounds of uh, microbes. Um, let me put it another way. 40% by dry weight of stool is bacteria. 